and thanks for joining us. Whether you're here in our interactive webinar platform, in our YouTube stream, or in a recorded session, welcome to today's webinar, Physical Activity Across the Lifespan for Individuals with Disabilities, brought to you by the Military Caregiving Team of the Military Families Learning Network. I'm Jen Gielik, Webinar Coordinator, and I'd like to call your attention to the link on the slide and in the chat window and in the event information box. That link will connect you to slides, handouts, and other event materials. And those are available for you to get now or later, whether you're in the live event or in the recorded event, at learn.extension.org slash events slash 3286. The Military Families Learning Network is part of a DOD USDA partnership. And our passion is to connect military family service providers and cooperative extension professionals to research and to each other through innovative online programming. We'd like to learn a little bit more about you. So I'm going to open up a quick poll for you to please choose from the available options that would describe your current employer. If none of those apply, please choose other. And then when we pop back over to the chat, would you share in the chat window what you would categorize your, how you would categorize your current employer. It's interesting to see the reach and the variety of people that attend our online educational events. So I'll leave this up for, for just a minute for you to choose from the available options. Thank you for taking the time to do that. And now let's get to the reason you're, you're really here. Let me turn the microphone over to Rachel to introduce herself, today's topic, and today's presenter. Rachel? Thanks, Jen. Welcome, everyone, and good morning or um, good afternoon, depending on where you're located. Um, I'm Rachel Browner. As Jen mentioned, I am with the Military Families Learning Network Military Caregiving Concentration Team. And so we're excited for today's presentation by Dr. Lytle. Um, just a few things to keep in mind for today. We welcome and encourage questions, feedback for our team as well as Dr. Lytle um, on the topic of today. So please post any of that um, questions, comments, feedback in that chat pod window. And between myself and other team members, we will make sure to monitor that and get a response to you. Also, I would like to welcome um, Mr. Keith Cooper. Mr. Keith Cooper is um, going to be posting or um, providing comments or feedback to any of your questions in that chat window. Uh, Mr. Cooper is a senior policy subject matter expert with the Military Adaptive Sports Program out of the Office of Warrior Care Policy. So if you have questions regarding that wounded warrior population, uh, Mr. Cooper will be able to respond or provide resources um, along with the many resources we have. Um, in that chat pod today. Um, our presenter today is Dr. Rebecca Lytle. Dr. Lytle is um, from the California State University out of Chico. She works with the Adapted Physical Education Program. And Dr. Lytle has taught adapted physical education to children age birth to 21 in the public schools of rural Northern California for over 10 years prior to completing her doctorate. Um, her research work has been in the area of collaborative consultation, the family needs and perspectives, as well as autism. She's she has over 30 publications and has managed over 18 grants and has completed over 80 presentations. So we're really excited to have Dr. Lytle here talking about um, physical activity in individuals with disabilities across the lifespan. And so at this time, I'll go ahead and um, let Dr. Lytle take over the presentation reins. Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for being here today. It's really exciting to see where everybody is joining us from around the United States. So uh, again, thank you for being here. And if you have questions at any time during the presentation, please feel free to um, ask and Rachel will make sure I don't miss your questions because this presentation is really for you. 
But to help me with this presentation, I'd like to start with a couple of quick questions for you. So if you could just uh, type into the chat box the first one, which is what ages or groups do you work with? So what, kind, what ages of disabilities are you working with children or adults, folks in the schools, whatever? So if you could kind of type that in real quick. It's helpful to see the responses. It looks like a lot of people are working with all kinds of ages from birth through seniors. So that's great. It's helpful to know. Wonderful. All right, that's really helpful. And can you tell me a little bit about what types of disabilities you're working with? Are you working primarily with folks with physical disabilities or intellectual disabilities or all types of disabilities? So it sounds like we have a little bit of everything. So that's really helpful for me to know as we move into the presentation. So let's go ahead and get started. And again, as I said, if you have questions along the way, please don't hesitate to just type it into the box there and we'll do our best to answer your questions and get feedback from the group. So this is our agenda for today. We're gonna to start with defining physical activity then we're going to discuss a little bit about the benefits of physical activity for individuals with disabilities. Then we're going to learn a little bit about matching activities to individual skills and interests and um, the recommended levels of physical activity. And then hopefully we can talk a little bit about ways to reach out into your communities and help people get more engaged. So first let's talk about what the definition of physical activity is, because many people have had both positive and negative experiences with physical activity. The term physical activity will generally refer to any bodily movement um, that enhances health. So it's beyond the daily routine of basically um, standing or light walking. So we think about walking briskly, jump roping, dancing, lifting weights, things that kind of push us. It doesn't have to be a lot, but a little bit. Those are the kinds of things that will enhance our physical activity levels. And it might be things that we do in our normal day, like um, chores, bringing in firewood, cleaning the house, working in the garden, things like that. So what exactly is physical activity and why should I care about it, working with individuals with disabilities? Well, physical activity isn't just about exercise, games, or sport or even leisure activities, though these are all really wonderful things. Let's get back, go back, and just visit the basics of movement and what the components of movement include and why they're important. Because often after a disability, if it's an acquired disability, we are relearning basic skills again and how to combine those basic skills, such as after a spinal cord injury, an amputation, a head injury, or any other type of acquired disability. So this illustration shows the hierarchy of movement. So when we think about infants and young children, and some of you, it sounds like, work with infants, we begin as we're born with our reflexes and, re and um, reactions. And these are mostly um, non-voluntary responses that we're born with. Those are slowly integrated as we begin to learn fundamental motor skills. And those are things like walking, running, jumping, hopping, and climbing. Eventually, once we've mastered those skills, we begin to combine those skills into low organized games, such as tetherball or four square or other kinds of simple playground games that don't require a lot of different skills or a lot of rules. And eventually, we then move into more complex games and sports, such as badminton or tennis or soccer or other kinds of recreational activities. This hierarchy is important because when you're working with individuals, it's important to match the physical activity to the age and the needs of the individual.
So now we're going to talk a little bit about the language of movement. So when you think about learning to read, you first learn the alphabet. So you learn your letters, and then you put those letters together to make words. You put those words together to make a sentence, and then you put the sentences together to make a paragraph and ultimately a complete story. Movement is the same way. So um, we have basically two components in the foundations of movement. We have skill themes, which are the uh, what we do, and we have movement concepts that are the how we do these things. So this first slide shows you some of the basic skill themes, and you're all familiar with these. You do them every day. So you um, the basic locomotor skills include walking, running, hopping, skipping, etc. And then the non-manipulative skills like turning, twisting, balancing, jumping, curling, etc. And then manipulative skills like throwing, catching, kicking, volleying, striking, all kinds of activities that we use and combine to participate in sport and games. The second half of the language of movement are the movement concepts, which are the how we move. And when you think about working with children with disabilities, particularly intellectual disabilities, they might have some of the skills as seen here, but they are really struggling with concepts. So understanding where you are in space, my personal space versus moving with others, or understanding the directions up, down, forwards, backwards, understanding the different levels that we move, high, medium, and low, or the pathways that we move in straight, curved, or zigzag, and effort qualities. Many children with disabilities have trouble with gradation of movements. Um, for example, with effort qualities, they either are on or off. They can't move in that medium space in between. They're either <laughs> moving at full speed or they're not moving at all. So helping children learn the movement concepts are critical in terms of their ability to function and move properly. And then the last major category is relationships. So we have relationships in movement to body parts, where we put our body in space. Uh, we have um, relationships to objects, such as going over, under, around, through, uh, moving alongside people, away from people. And then lastly, um, the relationships we have with individuals in terms of how we move with them, so leading or following mirroring or matching, um, alone or in a mass. So when you think about the skill themes and the movement concepts, um, let's just take an example and I want you to see if you can identify for me all of the skills and the movement concepts you need to know um, in order to participate in that. So if you think about the game of basketball, just type into the box, what skills do you need to play basketball? Balance, excellent. A lot of skills, absolutely. Throwing, right, walking, running, jumping, eye hand coordination, motor coordination. Exactly. So if we look at just this skill theme list, and feel free to keep typing. You need to know how to walk, run, hop, uh, slide, uh, flee, dodge. You need to be able to turn and twist and balance and hop. You need to be able to throw and catch, dribble. Um, and then in this, you need to understand where you are in relationship to others. And um, you need to know how to lead and follow, to mirror and match, to move in combination with others. So you can take anything we do in a given day and break it down into these two um, skills from these two slides, and basically that's the general language of movement. So let's take a moment now um, and let me throw another question your way. Tell me a little bit about what is available in your community in relationship to physical activity. So when you think about where you live, um, in Washington, Virginia, Texas, Illinois, Georgia, wherever it is you are signing in from, and you think about the folks you work with, 
what kinds of things are available in your community? So I see YMCA, walking trails, rec centers, sport groups, YMCA, sidewalks, good, gyms, organized team sports, bike trails, child and youth services, boys and girls club. So as you um, list things, look at the kinds of things other people are printing in as well, and it may help give you some ideas of other things that may be in your own area. Swimming, hiking trails, good. Excellent. So there are a variety of things in your communities, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. So the reason I ask you about that is it's important to match the activity to the participant. And um, some people really enjoy competitive sports, and oftentimes when we think about physical activity, we think about what's at the rec center and um, team sports and those kinds of activities. But there are a host of things that are available for both in the, those who like sport and those who prefer a more recreational or non-sport based activity. Um, oh, one other point I wanted to mention is that uh, we also know that for children and also true for adults, that the more physically active an individual is and the more fit they are, the higher their academic performance tends to be. And there's a direct correlation between those because the more active you are, the more blood flow you have to the brain, the better your performance is gonna be. So here's just some examples of um, movement early in life and then how we use it later in life. So here's an infant that is using head control and crawling. And here's a picture of someone using that skill uh, later in life. So how we use these basic skills. Here's an example of an infant reaching to get on this uh, laptop. Example of reaching in a sport, such as basketball, and reaching in daily life in a work setting. Here's an example of the importance of understanding and learning spatial awareness in sport, for example, in baseball or basketball or soccer, where you move in relationship to others is critical for the success of the game. And then on the right hand side, we see a very busy parking lot and certainly without spatial awareness, you're gonna have trouble maneuvering through that parking lot um, as a pedestrian or as a driver. And here's another example of the skill of running. We use this in sport and also, of course, um, it's critical for catching a bus, a train, a plane, or chasing after a young child. So all skills we need in life. And here's an example of catching in sport and catching in life. So why am I providing you with all of these examples? The reason I am is because if we don't stay physically engaged and physically active, we won't be able to engage in these life skills that transfer over. Oh, and here's another one, hopping in the sport and hopping in life. Are there any questions so far? All right, let's move ahead now and talk a little bit about the benefits of physical activity for individuals with disabilities. I'm seeing a question down here. Introducing physical activity can be an uncomfortable topic. What suggestions do you have for service providers who would like to talk with clients in a safe environment? That's a good question, Lakshmi. Um, one of the reasons I'm sharing with you how physical activity is important for function is because sometimes that's a good way to approach the topic. Many people have had really negative experiences with physical activity or when they think back to their childhood, participating in sport or um, uh, there are many factors that can make people uh, uncomfortable with the topic of physical activity. So I think the more we can sort of uh, understand where the individual is coming from, and in a minute we'll talk about barriers, but um, understanding if they 
previously, if it's, are, are you speaking in terms of someone who has an acquired disability or someone who um, was born with a disability? Could be both, okay. Um, yeah, so that comes to um, really finding the match between the person's interest. And we'll talk more about some of these examples, but physical activity can happen in so many different forums. And we tend to think of the traditional, like participating in a sporting event or going to a yoga class or um, going to the rec center. But physical activity can happen in very indirect ways. For example, if you, if this individual really loved art, you could go to museums and walk around the museums, and that would be positive physical activity. Um, if somebody was really into politics and they w wanted to be a canvasser and go around and share information, you could get exercise by doing that. So there are lots of ways that we can build physical activity into our days, and it doesn't have to be an intimidating process. Does that make sense? Let me know if you have another question as we move on. Okay, and I think the most important thing about physical activity is that it has to be fun and it has to be playful for the person. And if it's not, they're not going to be motivated to want to continue to do it. So that's the most, the, I think the most critical thing is it has to have an element of play and engagement to match for the person. Some folks are naturally competitive and they love sport, but many people are not uh, naturally competitive and sport may not be the best, best match for them. Good comments, Andrew. <laughs> yes, excellent comment, Andrew. Um, so yes, emphasizing where the person is and starting with where they're ready to begin. So let's talk a little bit about the benefits of physical activity, and sometimes that can be a key point for um, helping people to want to engage. So physical activity really improves uh, blood pressure and glucose levels. It can help protect against heart disease and stroke by strengthening the heart and improving circulation. It reduces diabetes and controls weight. It can reduce contractures and pressure sores and spasticity can help keep joints flexible by moving the body and increasing the blood flow. And it can reduce pain in people who have chronic conditions such as inflammatory diseases. It can also improve digestion. For example, someone with paralysis, um, by getting them up and moving more, it really will help with their um, bowel control and digestive processes. Exercise also increases dopamine and norepinephrine and serotonin levels and has been shown to be better than antidepressants in decreasing depression. And there's plenty of research that support physical activity also helps with PTSD. All of these same benefits are true for children. Children and adults both need physical activity and benefit from the same kinds of, of outcomes. For people with chronic disease or disability, physical activity can lessen the severity or improve the outcomes for life expectancy, as well as the quality of life. And strengthening muscle groups can help improve balance, agility, and mobility, which lead to improved weight-bearing activities such as standing and walking, and thus improve independence and reduce stress on caregivers. How many of you are um, working with caregivers right now? Some of you, yes. And what kind of challenges are, are you hearing 
coming from the caregivers. Respite providers, excellent. Motivation, burnout, yes. Those are all really good points. Focus on for healing. Okay, you are bringing up some really good points about fatigue and exhaustion. Um, being concerned about fragility. So those are all really important. And I do think that if you're working with somebody who is extremely fragile, it is important to work with the physical therapist or occupational therapist to make sure that that person um, is able to stand and do some weight bearing and moving around. So those are all important things as we look at physical activity. And for somebody who is um, uh, much older and very fragile, physical activity might just be getting up and um, using a walker to move around the house or to get outside and sit in the garden and walk around outside to get some fresh air. So it really is going to depend on the level and function of the individuals for sure. Yes, Audrey, you bring up a really good point about caregivers getting burnt out. And um, boy, I don't have an easy answer for that one right now. Does anybody have suggestions from the audience about how they're helping caregivers uh, prevent burnout? Certainly, um, sessions like this on stress management would be helpful, perhaps for this group, which is sort of beyond the scope of this one, but might be an idea for future activities. And um, yes, respite care is a wonderful resource. And I don't know enough about what the military provides or if they do have resources for respite care for care providers who are struggling. Um, if, you, if there are those resources, it would be important to look at what's available in your community. Also, depending on the type of disability that an individual has, they may be eligible for certain kinds of, of resources for respite care through their uh, Department of Rehab um, or their ARC associations or other kinds of programs for people with disabilities. But I know that finding good respite care can also be very challenging. Yes, thank you, Alicia. Time for physical activity could be helpful. Yeah, maybe just as much for the caregivers as it is for the individuals with disabilities. Good point. All right, we're going to uh, move on a little bit if we're ready. And um, oh, excellent. Rachel, thank you for posting some respite resources. I think that will be helpful for folks. Yeah, and there are support groups, whether they're family support groups, caregiver support groups, those can be very helpful as well. And it looks like ah, there's also um, a self-care series that was hosted. So wonderful resources that are out there that may be helpful for folks. A little bit more on um, physical activity, and please feel free to continue to post questions as you have them. Um, in addition to all those physical benefits of physical activity for your internal systems and strength and bone density and all those wonderful things, um, for those of you who work with individuals that have um, autism or intellectual disabilities, Physical exercise has been recognized now as one of the evidence-based practices for autism spectrum disorder. And it can be hugely helpful in reducing stereotypic behaviors. It can help reduce aggression and off-task behaviors, um, elopement, which is running away basically, and uh, can help reduce stress and anxiety in children with uh, high anxiety or on the autism spectrum disorder. Uh, it is important to recognize, though, that it does have a short-term effect. So you can't just say, well, we'll exercise once a day and that'll take care of it. 
So what, what they found with the research is that if you um, provide a pretty good intensity level of physical activity for a child and then have them sit and do focus work, they will do much better at that. So um, it can serve beneficially for learning and focus. Any questions before we talk about the recommended doses of physical activity? Mm, I'm seeing some wonderful resources posted. Uh, yes, Rachel's mentioning the resources. So this just happens to be, April happens to be Move More Month. So uh, the timing was good, I think, for this presentation. And I did provide you with a host of uh, um, handouts that are put out by the American Heart Association. And they are to help with ideas on how to just move more in general. So there's a move more anytime, anywhere, <coughs> excuse me, how to move more at work and how to move more at home. So there's a host of wonderful suggestions and um, activities. For example, um, moving more anywhere, things like parking farther away, um, or using the stairs, um, taking your kids for a walk, um, going to ballroom dancing, a host of things like that. Um, ideas for work is, for example, in my office, what I do is I don't print in my office, I print in the main office, so every time I print something, I have to get up and walk down the hall. Uh, so there's lots of wonderful suggestions here for both the home and work environments for increasing activity. There's also a really nice list um, related to motivation. And there are, let's see, 30 different suggestions to really help with uh, motivation, motivation and making sure that physical activity gets built into the day. So um, let's talk a little bit about the recommended amounts of physical activity. So for children, the recommendation is 60 minutes every day. Um, and the hope is that they're getting some aerobic strengthening and uh, muscle strengthening and bone strengthening. And here's the link for you if you're interested in the future for the guidelines. For adults, the recommended amount is 150 minutes a week, which roughly comes out to about uh, 30 minutes a day on most days. And of course, in the best case scenario, you would have some muscle strengthening and some aerobic kinds of activity. But really, the bottom line is you just need to get up and move, and it doesn't matter what it is. And um, the research does show that you don't have to do it all at once. So 10 minutes at a time is just as good. So if a person is more frail, which came up in our discussion, you could do five minutes at a time. So getting up and just moving around the house or getting up and walking outside around the yard and um, looking at the plants or picking some flowers to bring them in. There's all kinds of ways that we can add physical activity into our day. Um, so, you know, for me at work, instead of, uh, if I'm gonna go on a coffee break, I'll get up and walk across campus to go get a cup of coffee instead of getting one here in, in our building. And that gets me out and moving for five to 10 minutes. So there's lots of ways to really build it into a day. So now we're gonna talk about some of the, the tougher topics. And um, research shows that 76.8% of adults with disabilities aged 18 years and over were um, experienced physical or program barriers that limited or prevented them from using local health and wellness programs. And you all mentioned several really good resources in your communities like the YMCA and the recreation programs um, and local rec. And the question I have for you at this point is to really bring up what barriers uh, to participation in physical activity are you seeing in your, com in your communities? What are the primary barriers for folks?
I, Rachel, I like your comment about it looks like you need to move more. <laughs> I think we all can build it in pretty easily. Okay, so Chris says there's a lack of sidewalks and street lighting. Weather can definitely be an issue. Getting started, excellent heat, transportation. So I'm going to just make some notes here. Formal exercise. Yeah, I do that PS form. Yes. Yeah, I do the physical activity is um, exercise that has to be done at the gym. Lack of resting benches alongside walking routes. Um, pain, distance. All right, excellent. So those are all really legitimate barriers that prevent people from getting engaged. And weather can be a huge one. Um, Audrey from Oaxaca, is it that the weather is too hot or too cold or both? Too hot, absolutely. I can relate to that. In Chico, it's 110 in the summertime sometimes. So uh, the last thing I want to do is go be outside. And for some of you, yeah. I don't know where you are, Alicia, but it can be way too cold and snowy in some places. So, yep, and safety is a concern. You're bringing up lots of wonderful, I, I, not so wonderful, um, barriers to physical activity. Absolutely. Uh, and rain. Okay. That's excellent. Mall walking. Mall walking is a great idea. Snow on the ground, yes. So you're bringing up lots and lots of um, typical kinds of barriers. And uh, I'm going to show you a slide now. Still snow, OK. Lack of motivation. Yeah, I think motivation often can be the biggest barrier. So these are the kinds of things, that, some research that was done by um, Dr. Rimmer looking at the barriers to physical activity and weather isn't on here, which is a good one that you all mentioned. Um, but transportation can be a problem. Having somebody to work out with motivation is a huge one. Physical access, attitudes, self-perception, fear and anxiety or lack of knowledge on how to start, which you you all have brought up many of those. So um, maybe as a group, we could brainstorm some of those ways that we can overcome some of those barriers. For example, if it's, let's just tackle one of them. If it's weather, who can think of examples of ways that we can overcome the barrier of weather? That one to me seems like one that's pretty straightforward. Exactly, we can move indoors. We can go to um, recreation centers. We can walk in malls. Most places where the weather's really cold or really hot, there are indoor spaces where um, people can move. And certainly many people like to shop, so walking in the malls can be a fun activity. Yes, Lakshmi, you mentioned motivation, and I think motivation is and attitudes can be the biggest barrier, whether it's, um, a, as we mentioned earlier, a lot of people have very negative perceptions about physical activity. And so I think sometimes you have to couch it in a different way. Like don't refer to it as physical activity. Say we want to go do something. We want to get up and move more. We want to get out more often. We want to go find some activities in the community to do. And those activities could be all kinds of things. Like I mentioned, um, going to museums or just walking around your downtown area or you know, going to search for, I don't know what it is, fountains in your city, whatever, it's something interesting that might spark a person's interest. Or if a person likes crafts, you know, going to the craft stores and walking around the stores and looking at different things and getting ideas. So there, are, again, I'm trying to emphasize the importance that um, it doesn't have to be sort of what we think of as organized physical activity. It can be built in in little teeny chunks throughout the day. Now, certainly if somebody is interested in engaging in 
uh, organized activities, that's great, and we want to see that. But for many people, that's not where their interest lies. Let me take a look at some of the comments here. Homebound, yes. Okay, so for somebody who's homebound, there are certainly lots of things. There's all kinds of um, apps for, uh, and depending on what the cause of the homebound uh, needs are, there are uh, modified yoga programs, there are modified exercise programs, there are a host of things that you can do with uh, music or other kinds of activities that you could do in the home. So I think that, you know, those are certainly some suggestions. Um, you can bring in personal trainers who can help with ideas for exercises. And as I said, there's apps for everything from um, Tai Chi to yoga to exercise plans to, you know, if you want to do some sort of specific type of exercise. And there are also certainly basic kinds of home significantly modified depending on the person's abilities, like doing um, wall push-ups as opposed to, or counter push-ups, you know, if somebody wants to do an actual exercise program with, with some significant modifications. Great, Andrew's posted a wonderful resource there on uh, the National Institute on Aging. So that would, looks like that would be a wonderful resource as well for ways to engage in activity. Um, can you think of any other ideas or strategies to overcome some of those barriers that you'd like to share? Rose is busy because he likes to play. Yes, Alicia, you make a good comment. For those with busy lifestyles, creating creativity is the key. Oh, it looks like you've posted a wonderful TED Talk on walking meetings. Oh, that's an excellent su suggestion, and I think that might be in some of the handouts. Um, walking meetings are a wonderful way to engage in physical activity while you're at work. So, uh, Rachel, you mentioned you need more physical activity. Maybe that's one way that you can get it into your work day. Um, I actually have a meeting here that uh, was a standing meeting. They didn't want people to lounge around and get too comfortable. So we have a meeting every Thursday morning that is uh, from 8.30 to 9, and it's a standing meeting. So people will share what they need to share and move on and go back to whatever it is they need to do in their day. So that was a new concept for me, standing meetings. Any other um, suggestions? A little goes a long way. Yeah, thank you, Chris, for that comment. Um, physical activity is really important. I think if people have a good understanding of how it helps, you know, the bottom line is if we stop moving, we cease to exist. And we know that the um, lack of activity is the number one, uh, one of the number one causes of mortality. So that just the notion of moving. Our bodies were meant to move, not meant to sit. So we just have to get up and move around. Doesn't matter what it is. So Chris, great point. A little does go a long way. And um, I'm glad you mentioned the Fitbit. There are lots of apps. Um, I have an Apple Watch and it has a little plan on there. It tells me when I've been sitting too long and it tells me when I need to get up. And a lot of these apps, whether it's the Fitbit or the Apple Watch or other kinds of, of tech systems, they also, they'll not only do steps, but they'll also do, uh, for wheelchair users, they'll show, um, they can register pushes so, and can adapt to all kinds of things. So those are wonderful resources if you're working with folks who want to do step count. And I don't know how many of you have heard that the step count recommendations are 10,000 steps a day. 10,000 steps a day is quite a few steps. And most of you, if you carry a phone on you, often the phone will tell you how many steps you've had in a day. And that's another good way to track. But the bottom line, I think, is just getting up and getting the movement. So um, getting out of your chair and walking around, if that's what it is. And again, remember, 
30 minutes of moderate activity a day, and you can do it in 10-minute increments. Andrew, there's a wonderful, that's a wonderful suggestion um, for people with dementia about building physical activity into their routine. And that's a really good point. It may be that they get up in the morning and after they have breakfast, they always do their walk. And then after they din have dinner, they do their second walk or something along those lines. So great suggestions. I've put up, a, what I'm going to show you now is a couple of brief examples of how someone can build activity into their day pretty easily. Because again, not everybody wants to go to the gym and for some that's a great resource, for others it may not be. So here is an example of Marta. Marta has a physical disability. And pets are a wonderful way to get exercise. So here's some examples. So in the morning she walked the dog for 15 to 20 minutes and on the Weekend on Sunday, she gets some yard work in, and then she walks the dog in the evening, and then um, she might do some additional activities pending her personal interests. So given that, she's already got an hour of physical activity on Sunday, which is more than the recommended amount. And on Monday, she walks the dog. Uh, she walks from the parking lot to work and back. That's about 10 minutes and then she does yoga. So there, again, she's got over an hour of physical activity on Mondays. Tuesday, she walks the dog, um, again, walking to and from the parking lot for work, walks the dog in the evening, goes to a swim program in the evening, and um, so she's exceeded her, her 30 minutes. She's got an hour and a half in. So if you add up the minutes for this individual over the course of the week, she has over an hour hour and a half to two hours uh, every day of the week just by adding a few things in. I'm just taking a look at some of the comments here. Um, yes, Rachel mentioned some of the handouts, mapping physical activity via goal setting. So this I have provided for you in the handouts a sort of a daily planner and you can plug in what the person is already if you take a look at it, it has the days and times, and you can plug in what their daily schedule looks like, and then um, look to determine are there things in there already that are built in where the person is getting physical activity, and then you can determine do they need more physical activity or not, and if so, then how can you go about building that into their weekly schedule? Let me give you a couple more examples. Here's an example of Kevin. He's a 10-year-old with an intellectual disability. So on his normal uh, school week, he walks to and from school 20 minutes. He plays with family for 20 minutes, and he jump ropes or plays, does gymnastics in the afternoon. Um, on Tuesday, he walks to and from school. He plays on the playground for 20 minutes, and then he climbs on the playground equipment for 20 minutes. Wednesday, he walks to and from school, he plays with friends for 25 minutes, and then in the evening, he jump ropes, um, runs for five minutes, and is climbing in the yard for 10 minutes. So you can see as we go through his week, if you look at his total minutes, he has between 60 and 80 minutes a day um, by just building in these things that a kid would typically be doing. Now, if you live where it's snowy or super hot, you might not have this walk to and from school piece in there, so you might have to integrate something else. Maybe there's indoor climbing walls or other kinds of things where the children can play. It might even be you know, going to the McDonald's and, and letting them play in the climbing structure in the ball pits, or if you have a pizza parlor in your town that has those activities, they might be playing in those kinds of things. So as we think about planning activities for individuals, um, we, we want to make sure that it's developmentally appropriate for the person. So when we think about um, planning activities for kids, we want to make sure that it fits for their skills and abilities. And I say this because too often we see 
children with um, children being put into programs or activities that really are developmentally appropriate for them. For example, in my community, we have lots and lots of soccer programs and um, t-ball programs, and, you, and we see kids that are, you know, four, five years old signing up for the t-ball programs. And really, as much as I love baseball, it's one of my favorite sports. What we see is the kids are standing out in the fields picking daisies. And really that level of a full on full game participation for a five year old or six year old may not be appropriate for that child. What they need is a mini game with uh, two or three people or four people or a mini soccer where it's two on two. So you want to make sure that the activities that you are providing are appropriate. And that means it should be based on their age, interest, and typically what others their age might be doing. So, um, you know, when we think about working with adults with developmental disabilities, you wouldn't necessarily want adults to be playing duck, duck, goose. Uh, that's something that preschoolers play. So for an adult with a developmental disability, you want to think about, well, what are other adults their age doing and how can we do something that, that is comparable or that they can participate in? All right, I'm taking a look at some of the comments here. Rachel has posted the mapping physical activity inventory. She's also mentioned that summer's around, around, right around the corner and that there is a list of camps that have been posted for youth and adults. And I see there's a question from Lakshmi. What cues should service providers be looking for during their conversations with clients so they can suggest physical activity as a resource? Um, Lakshmi, could you clarify for me, what do you mean when you ask what cues should they be looking for during the conversation so they can suggest physical activity? I guess, you know, maybe you can clarify, but um, if you use that inventory to see if you're trying to look restlessness. Oh, and okay, Andrew, I see what you're suggesting, hyperactivity. Yes, those can definitely be signs that physical activity should be recommended. Um, if you're working with, with families who have children with disabilities, absolutely. Um, it's beneficial for kids that are restless or hyperactive active or have ADHD, but also for the non-active child. The non-active child often ha is at risk for obesity, um, or if they're in a wheelchair, they're at risk for contractures and pressure sores. So I think that it's important to look at uh, all of our participants or clients that we're working with and determine if they're getting the kinds of physical activity that they need to um, benefit their health. Kids being stressed or tired, perhaps. Um, yeah, I think that the Alicia, I think your point is well taken. That physical activity is is really important as you work with any of your clients. Just as you talk about their nutrition, um, if you're working with care providers, you're always going to ask about you know how are they engaged cognitively in their life? How are they engaged with their nutrition? Are they eating properly? And how are they engaged in their physical activity? And are they getting enough physical activity during their day? Thank you for that heads up, um, Rachel, on the 10 minute uh, marker. So here's some additional suggestions in terms of uh, how you select physical activity. So, too often we just pick an activity because it's the only thing in town, like I mentioned, baseball or soccer. But there are lots of other ways to be physically active. So uh, many programs, um, the problem with many community programs is they're often only working with the typical performer. And this can be a challenge. I know in our community, our recreation program has a statement in their magazine that <clears throat> of what's going on that uh, they don't discriminate against anybody. But the challenge is that their activities also aren't necessarily designed for people of varying abilities. 
And so uh, many of our families struggle because they're not going to sign up for those programs because they're just not a good fit. So how do we go about uh, selecting programs? We're going to ask some of these questions. Is it going to be fun for the person? Because if it isn't fun, it's not going to be motivating. <clears throat> um, can I be successful at this program? Do I have the skills I need? And if I don't have the skills, can I learn the skills? I think Andrew mentioned, you know, if you want to do a marathon, you got to start with a step. So maybe you want to play basketball, but you don't know how to catch or dribble. Well, you can learn the basic skills to develop into participating in a particular activity. Or if you want to learn how to snow ski or you want to learn how to snowboard or sit ski. <clears throat> Does the program provide for variations in ability? I think, and again, that's what I just mentioned, I think often programs don't provide for enough, enough variation in ability. And I think as community members and advocates, we can be asking those questions about the programs in our community. We can call and find out um, what kinds of resources do you have for people with X type of disability, wherever it is. If it's a local fitness club, do you have um, trainers that are trained in working with older adults or trained with working with people with disabilities? If you want to go to a ski program, do they have suit skis available so that we can use those for our ski program? If I go to the um, wellness center, is there adequate space? Is the equipment accessible? So those are all things that we need to be looking at and asking those questions. And if they aren't, I think it's part of our job is to advocate for that and say, well, you know, it would be really helpful if you had a pool lift so folks could get in and out of your pool, or it would be really helpful if you had um, whatever it is so that everyone can participate in the activities. So is it fun? I mentioned that one. <clears throat> is it functional and enjoyable? Certainly um, things like bicycle riding or swimming are wonderful activities that can be very helpful and functional. And someone talked about older adults. A lot of times um, if you have access to a warm pool, that can be a wonderful way to take pressure off of joints and to move and relax in a nice environment. Is it playful? It's important that people are having fun and we talked about that a little bit earlier. And again, here's some kids having fun. But we will also want the same to be true for adults. Success. Again, as I mentioned, um, creating success is critical for somebody to want to return. I think too often people, you know, one of the reasons a lot of people are, um, have had bad experiences with physical activity is because they were put into situations where they weren't successful. Whether that was a competition where they frequently lost because they didn't have the skills, or it was an activity they weren't interested in, or it was highly competitive and they're not a competitive person. There are a host of factors that can contribute to people's negative experiences around physical activity. So I need to ask the questions, do I have, does this person have the skills to participate in this? Do they have the knowledge to participate in this? Do they have the right equipment? Do they have the right supports in place? And um, do they have a perceived level of ability? Sometimes we have everything but the perceived level of ability, and that might be the biggest barrier, our, our own um, concerns. See, there's a question here. Do you have any suggestions for those working with families who may have had a negative experience with one program to try something else? Yes, absolutely, Alicia. I think that... Um, a lot of families have had negative experiences if they have children with disabilities. And um, what we often see is in many communities, it's the families who have a child with a disability who end up starting programs, whether that's an adapted soccer program or a challenger baseball program or so, some other kind of activity. But I would definitely encourage families to try other kinds of things. Um, there are if you are near any kind of a university or a community college, you may be able to find um, students that are majoring in special education or adapted physical education that are interested in 
um, getting hours and might be willing to work with the child and take them out to do things or to try other kinds of activities. Um, so that's another place for resources for families. Many of the community colleges or if you are near an adapted physical education program on a campus, they often have programs for kids with disabilities and programs for adults with disabilities that are um, geared for their success. And of course, if you're in a really remote area, you're not going to find something like that. Um, so if you have limited programs, it may be important to just try again with a different instructor or a different coach or um, a different scenario. And if anybody else has thoughts on that, please feel free to join in. And these are just the general guidelines for success. I know we're going to be wrapping up our time here pretty soon. Um, you know, choose physical activity for joy. Try to get at least 10 to 20 minutes. Consult your doctor. Start slow. Try to join with others. Um, keep, keeping a record of activity can really help, particularly if you're working with adults, because having them see their progress can be hugely helpful, whether that's minutes, um, steps, whatever you're doing to measure progress. And you can also mix up activities like gardening, dancing, walking. Remember, you don't have to move fast, you just have to keep moving. Um, we talked a little bit. Here's some other suggestions about community resources. Uh, looking at your school and what kind of quality physical education they have, what kind of adaptive PE programs they have, um, is there access to the intramural and interscholastic sports? And then I provided some links for Special Olympics and the adapted sports programs, your local rec, your local youth clubs, neighborhood parks, house, home, and backyard, which are all things that you have mentioned. And then um, in terms of adults, many of the same kinds of things. I just mentioned the community colleges and university programs, if you're near any of those health clubs, rec programs, wounded warriors, and I know um, Andrew here has information on that. So the handout I gave you has this example, and I think this is a good place to start if you're working with families, is to um, take this sort of sheet and plug in all of the activities. So here's an example of someone's day. They're what it looks like, and I've highlighted things that are already have built-in activity. So this person is getting really pretty much the recommended amount every, um, every day just by natural movements of walking to go get lunch, um, walking to and from the car, going for a bike ride on the weekend, or doing shopping or yard work on the, week, um, on the weekend. So as we mentioned earlier, we want to make sure that we match the skills and interests. And we talked briefly about, um, I, I did provide you with an inventory that looks at team sports, individual sports, dance, music, arts, crafts, and community activities such as social clubs or museums or volunteer work. So there are hundreds of ways that you can build movement into someone's day. So let's say I looked at the initial um, program here, plugged in what the person was doing, decided the person needed to add in some other kinds of experiences to uh, build in some joy or relaxation. And so I went through the inventory and found out that this person likes to go, really enjoys art. And so we built in an outing to see museums and art shows on Sundays. And then we also built in some yoga two evenings a week for relaxation and strengthening. So I'm hoping that that was helpful for you in terms of thinking about how to um, begin the process of not only understanding more about what physical activity is and how to build it into your day, but how to do it in conventional and non-conventional ways. And what other closing questions do you have as we wrap up today?
That's quite Thank you all the comments come participating today. As questions and comments come through, we're going to leave it open and um, just wanted to let everyone know that we are offering one CEU credit from the UT School of Social Work to credentialed participants, um, as well as a certificate of completion for those that may be interested in a training um, hour or needing just that certificate of completion um, for your supervisor. So please go to the link that I posted in the chat pod for that information. Again, I know we had a lot of resources and information posted throughout today's session in that chat pod. Please don't be overwhelmed by those or in case you didn't catch all of them, it's okay. You can find all of those links from today as well as the link to the CEU information found at our learn.extension.org page. And that is where our PowerPoint slides are, our list for summer camps, um, a lot of these fact sheets and handouts. Um, so please go and check that out. Um, that is available. Don't forget to join us next month. We do have our next month's webinar on um, May 23rd. And the title for that webinar is Detour Ahead, Planning for Contingencies on Your Caregiving Journey. So that webinar next month is really going to focus on that military family caregiver, um, our very own Andrew Crocker is going to be presenting and we're also going to be highlighting for the month of May month of the military caregiver so please um, get excited about that presentation it's going to be again May 23rd at 11 a.m. Eastern Time and we're just going to discuss a lot of uh, contingency plans um, throughout that caregiving journey so some things might include critical decision making um, critical thinking, decision making skills, unanticipated detours in a caregiving journey. So in case that caregiver gets sick, what happens to that care recipient? Um, so please join us for that session. I'll go ahead and post that link as well in the chat pod um, so you can get registered and join us. Please um, continue to get connected with all of our um, concentration areas, not only our military caregiving team, but we do offer um, professional development within areas surrounding personal finance, family transitions, family development, nutrition, wellness. So please join us um, in all of our concentration areas, not only military caregiving. Um, and again, we're going to stay on for a little bit longer for those to gather any final um, links that they're looking for, or if you have any questions or comments, we're going to stay on for a couple more minutes. But again, we appreciate your time this morning, um, your participation, your feedback, your comments. And Dr. Lytle, we thank you for a great presentation today. Thank you, thank Rachel. You for having and yes, thank you, Rebecca. It was a great, great event today, and we do appreciate your expertise. Um, and thank you to all the participants also for sharing your thoughts, your questions, your ideas, and your resources. We do invite you to explore all the learning opportunities that we offer, and we hope to see you in another webinar or another online event soon. As Rachel said, we will leave this room open for another minute or two to allow you to collect any links that you need or make any last comments, and then we invite you to close your browser to leave the event. We do hope to see you again soon at another Military Families Learning Network online learning event. Thanks again and have a great day.